You know, you've got to punch your ticket and pay the price. So discipline is not a bad thing. You're not crazy to work to be self-disciplined because that's what gets you to this higher level and also gets you to just just live your life so that when the day is over, you're, you're calm. So I was thinking about put your ass where your heart wants to be because the other day I was feeling like sick. I wasn't feeling super well. And I, I felt like I had every excuse not to sit down and write, but I sort of gutted it out anyway. And it was one of the best writing days that I'd had in a long time. And I think about that tension because like, I think people think that writers sort of one always want to do it. That's always fun. Uh -huh. That it always comes easily. But a lot of it, I think that the, the thing that makes it work is the days that you show up that you don't want to. I, there's a lot to that, Ryan. And I think it's, you know, it's true for the gym, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you, you're a runner, right? Sure. You know, those days when you think, oh, my God, I can't stand this. You know, one more minute, you know. Somehow, sometimes, I don't know why that is. Do you have any idea why that is? No, I don't. It, and it's, it, it's like you get whatever that point. It, it's not fun at first, but you push. There's some, yeah. like, level or barrier that you break through maybe on those i'm just thinking as we're talking maybe on those days when there's like a head of steam built up and you don't know it there's heavier resistance against that mm. you know trying to stop that good stuff from coming out that yeah. could be it i bet that is it yeah it's, so if it's easy yes don't do it well and <laughs> and like if it if if you could do a good project by only showing up on the days when you felt like showing up You'd then never show up at all. Everyone would do it. Yeah. Right? Like that's then, true. Right. It's it's the difference maker is did you show up on the days when it was hot, when you were tired, when you weren't feeling it? It that's the that's you know what they say what separates the uh, the boys from the girls, which we wouldn't say anymore. Uh, now it's the amateurs <laughs> from the professionals. True, right? exactly. Is, yeah. Is did did you show up even when you didn't want yeah. to? Yeah. Although the irony is like a professional uh, shows up because they're getting paid. An amateur shows up because they want to, right? There is some uh, interesting tension in those. Although two words. I sort of think of when I think of myself as a, I thought of myself as a professional long before there was any money coming in. Sure, you know, and I, I think that's the way. I never show up because I think I'm going to get paid. Do you? I mean, <laughs> no, I, no, no. I just show up out of kind of a general, uh, you know. I don't know if pride is the right word, but you know, just if I didn't, I would hate myself and I couldn't sleep that night. You know. Well, I think that that is the the tricky part about writing too, in a lot of professions, which is like, okay, yeah, if you if you're a salesperson, you show up today, you make your sale, you get paid or whatever. But as a writer, the contribution of one day or one hour or one month, it's really not possible to quantify to put a number on it. So it's easy to cheat yourself or to cheat the thing because you don't like. I think about this like when I say yes to stuff that uh -huh. is like cool. It's like you don't, there's no way to quantify like, oh, hey, I've been neglecting my work by 10% or 20% or 30% uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. uh -huh. because there isn't the direct correlation between effort, output. It's the, the publishable output is a lagging indicator of the day to dayness of the thing. Yeah. But the, then the other part of that is if you miss a day, the next day is that much harder, you know, yep. and you're falling a little bit behind. You know, what I wanted to ask you, how do you, in your own mind, decide when non-writing stuff is worthy of your time? You know, how do you, how do you separate, how do you compartmentalize the two? Because I'm sort of wrestling a little bit with that myself. Well, I think it's hard. And I think the pandemic, to go to what we were just saying, the pandemic was very illustrative to me because suddenly all the non-writing stuff more or less disappeared. And then I, but I still had a book that I was writing. This is when I was writing Courage. And I felt like I was so much more locked in on that book. And I feel like it was, I don't want to say better, but it was, it it was illustrative to me, oh, this is what the opportunity costs of all the things yeah, I yeah, said yeah. yes to is. So um, how do you decide when to say yes and when to say no? Well, I think a big part of it is like, do I actually want to do it or not? Like, I, I think realizing that like, 
a lot of the stuff I don't want to do at all. Uh-huh. And <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. Right. Uh-huh. I remember I was working at American Apparel well, after I'd written this obstacle had come out. I think I was working at Ego. This is when the company was like in turnaround. And I remember getting like a ping on my watch that I had like a staff meeting to get to or something. And I remember thinking, I've written three like <laughs> best selling books. How many people would kill to be able to be a full time writer? And could financially be a full-time writer, which I could have been at that time. And here I am rushing to a staff uh, meeting because I can't just fully be pro yeah, at that yeah. thing. And so a lot of it is just like, like the professional stuff that I do that's not writing is often stuff that I like doing or I think is complementary to the writing. Uh-huh. Um, but... Uh, but it's hard. And then the third variable is obviously family too, right? Like I have young kids. So when I'm saying yes to this stuff, I'm traveling and going places. Like uh, I got I got invited to the Super Bowl, like by one of the teams uh, in the Super Bowl. Uh-huh. And it was like, this would be really cool. But a weekend away meant a disruption of my writing routine. And it also meant like a weekend away from my kids. And yeah. I was like, I'm not going to. So I say no to a lot of stuff. I say yes to a lot of stuff, but I say no to a lot of stuff because I do have some sense of the opportunity cost. But the what I think was illustrative about the pandemic was suddenly you couldn't say yes to stuff and you realized uh, you yeah. didn't miss it when it wasn't there. Yeah. I mean, the pandemic really didn't affect me that much, didn't change my life sure. that much because my life was already sort of a pandemic type of life. Yes. But you my work from home. Yeah. Yeah was a little bit the opposite of yours. Like in my early years of writing, when I wasn't making any money and I, there was no such thing as the internet and everything. I mean, I, I was really, I look back on that nostalgically now where I was like, you know, committed. I mean, day, hours and hours and hours a day and really deeply into it. And it's only since like, you know, uh, social media and stuff as, and uh, you're to blame for like turning me on to some of that stuff, but you do have to promote yourself, right? Yes. That's part of it. And I have, I have problems with that, you know, and, uh, it, it's, it, it's stuff that has to be done. There's no doubt about it. And it is fun, but it, it, it it's a tough choice between yes and no sometimes. Cause when you say yes to to promoting something or even being out there, you're saying no to actually doing the work. Epictetus said that philosophy wasn't this dry, abstract thing. It was a thing he said you should be talking about, writing down, reading about, exploring with other people all the time. He said constantly have it at hand. That's how I think about philosophy. And it's weird. For the last five years, every single day, I've been writing this free email about Stoic philosophy. It's been not just cool to meet all these fellow practitioners of Stoic philosophy, but in writing about it, talking about it, reading it for our podcast, I have got to internalize these ideas in a way that I never would have been able to under any other circumstances. That's the idea. Philosophy is something you're supposed to engage in, not keep in these dusty old books or read once and be done with. It's a constant process. And I think that's why the email has worked so well for the people reading about it and sharing it and talking about it all of that as well. So I'd love to have you join us on this email. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash daily email. It's totally free, no spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I've basically given away a book for free every single year for five years, and I'm gonna keep on doing it until I drop dead. Check it out, dailystoic.com slash daily email. Although I guess I would have an ex- a slightly more expansive de- definition of what the work is, ah, right? I wanna so, hear this, yeah. So like, um, So one thing I realized is that I love the written word and I love words. Like I am a person who learns and uh, interacts with ideas through the written word, Uh like through, but that is not the primary medium for a lot of people. That's true, true, true. And so even even like uh, physical books, I love physical books. I basically only read physical books. But realizing now, as I look at my sales, more than 60% of my sales are audio and ebook. So I would, I would not consume either of those mediums, but I would never turn those people away, right? And so you think those, those people are either visual learners or, uh, or audio uh, learners. Right, right. And so um, thinking about how 
you can reach those people. Like, like let's say in one of your books, this is the story of Alexander the Great, and this is the story of the Spartans. Obviously, the primary message, medium for you to deliver that was by, you know, this book. Uh-huh. But if you could just tell someone that story, that would also be meaningful to you. Right. Like, uh-huh. talk, so I guess what I'm saying is I don't I don't limit myself to the ideas in the in the books as only being books. I believe in them enough that I want to talk about them in all the different mediums that people are willing to consume them in. Um, and uh, ultimately, I know that that comes back to books like when we had Jack Carr um, here. Uh, I remember I was talking to one of his readers out front and they were like a, a trucker or something like uh-huh. that. And they were like. I hadn't read a book since high school and someone told me to read one of his books and I started listening to it in an audio book on my drives. And they're like, now I've read everything that he's done, read everything read he's him. done. Plus they'd read my stuff. Like they uh-huh. fell in love with reading uh-huh. because they didn't think they liked reading, but they really, what they didn't like was physical books. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think about like, what is my job as a person who has something that I think is worth sharing all the different mediums that I can do that with. Like if I give a talk to, to, to someone, like a, let's say a, a group of people, and none of them read the books, but they took the ideas that are in the books and they applied it to their life as a result of the talk, I guess what do I really care? Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like the, the Maybe. time that I spent writing the book was not wasted because I couldn't have given the talk without the book. Ah. Uh-huh. But I'm sort idea. of from a different school. Okay. You know, to me, it's sort of the experience is in the book, you know, mm-hmm. rather than if I were just talking about it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the same thing. The experience is in the actual, the way the thing is laid out, the way the lines run, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm a consumer of the written word just like you. But I mean, uh, if, you, if you think about it like this, it's like, let's say you come up with a story and it's a book. And then that book gets adapted into a movie and then a TV show and then it's a radio thing and then it's a Broadway play. These are all uh, shoot offs of the same original idea. And they're the like the creative process, the satisf- the satisfaction from you was in creating it for a book. But those other mediums are still valuable uh extensions yes, I, of I agree with that yeah it's like talking about it is another thing that that's not the same thing I, I get it you know. I get it. by I'm the way saying, I want to say something to you here yeah. Th- and thank okay. you for uh you know when I came here you know two or three years ago whenever it was we're we're here this is this is the camera yeah. right we're here at Ryan's bookstore the painted porch and he was kind enough a couple of years ago I came here and said just please explain to me what is social media what is marketing and stuff like that and uh, the stuff that you told me really made a difference really oh, changed that's amazing. everything yeah I well, don't know if you know how much it changed. It changed things a lot for me. Really? It really helped, yeah. Well, that's very cool to hear. I mean, I've been a huge fan of your stuff for a very long time, obviously, so that like that I could pay it back in any oh, way. Oh, yeah, it helped I'll, me tremendously, yeah. I, I mean, it, it to me, I just think about these mediums as being very powerful mechanisms for delivering the stuff that I think is really important. But at the end of the day, I, I always have to remind myself the driving engine is the writing of the books. And... Not only is the driving engine the writing of the books, that's the one I like doing the most. So if the if the reward for being successful at what you do is that you don't have very much time to do that thing anymore, that's not success. Yes. If if LeBron James doesn't have time to play basketball, uh, he's doing something wrong. Yeah. Especially when, you know, there's some argument that you can only do that thing for a limited amount of time. Yeah. And how how much time how are you going to spend that, that window? Yeah. You know, I was thinking, I was reading, um, do you know who Dan Sullivan is? The, he's a kind of a mentor oh, to- yes, uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And I was reading one of, he does these little books, you know, and it was about your attention mm-hmm. and where you put your attention, you know? And I really, I had never really thought about that before. And this, this will go, see if you agree okay. with this. So I was, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking to myself, where do I put my attention, you mm-hmm. know? And I think that, that, uh, where my attention goes when I'm really doing it right, like if I'm writing a book like Gates of Fire or something like that, my attention goes to that world that is being created kind of through me, but not by me in the moment, you know? So when I sort of liken it to, and see if you agree with this, writing a book to me is a little bit like going into a 
a great cavern and you've got a little one of those miners lights on and there's a big thing in there. It's already there. And you're sort of exploring almost like uh, the painted things at Let's Go or whatever it is. And so that to me is where my attention is and where I want it to be. It's not in the real world. Sure. You know, and when I obviously I live in the real world, so I have to come out of that. But like you say, if, if LeBron James doesn't get to play basketball, he's not LeBron James. Yes. And so what takes anything that takes me away from that, and a lot of it's my fault yeah. for saying yes to things that I shouldn't say yes to, is is not healthy for me and it's not I'm not doing what I was put here to do. On the other hand, you can obviously do that too much. Yes. But that was kind of a, an insight to me that I hadn't thought about before. Yeah, I think that's right. And and I, I like to think about it. It's like, what is the uh, what are the things that only you can do? And what yeah. are the things that if you didn't that's do them, one. someone else would do them? Right. So like if 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 you're easily replaceable in a certain task or a certain opportunity, then it's probably not the right thing for you. Ah. Um, like. I think about this like with the team that I built out is like if I if I don't write, no one will write those uh-huh. things. Uh-huh. But if I don't uh, sweat about the taxes, someone uh-huh. else can uh-huh. sweat about the taxes, uh-huh. right? Like what are so what are the tasks? I, I have a, a story in the new book on Discipline and Destiny where uh, Harry Belafonte calls Martin Luther King, and Martin Luther King is not there. And Martin Luther King's wife answers the phone and they're trying to have this conversation and she keeps getting interrupted. She's got to put dinner in the oven. Uh, the kids are crying what, uh, over and over again. And finally, he, he, he's like, um, Coretta, can I ask you a question? And she's like, uh, yes. He's like, this is going to be sensitive, but do you have any help? And, and she's like, what do you know? What do you mean? Uh-huh. And he's like, why don't you have like a housekeeper and a maid uh-huh. and a and uh, an assistant and a chauffeur and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, Martin would never allow that. And he's like, this ends right now. Like I'm hiring a staff for you. Uh-huh. And it, you totally get Martin Luther King's reservations. He's a minister, he's right. serving. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. He feel, it feels weird that he would be enriching himself, like spending money from the donors on these sort of personal service things. But he's like, you guys are out there leading this movement. You can't be worried about whether there's milk in the fridge. Or yeah. Not. And so I think about like what are the like what are the things that only you can do? Like only Martin Luther King could go to jail as Martin Luther King. Uh-huh. Somebody else could pick his kids up from school or whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I think I think about that one on like the micro level. Like, do you have you built out a team around you to help you do what you do? And uh, and then uh, secondarily, like. What are things that don't need to be done at all? In meditations, Marcus Rulis says, ask yourself at every moment, is this task essential? And he says, if it's not essential, not only do you not do you eliminate inessential things, but you get the double benefit of doing the essential things better. And so, like, how often, like, people, they're like, I don't have time for social, I'm, a, I'm an author, I'm an artist, uh-huh. I don't have time uh-huh. for social media. And then you're like, you call them and you're like, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, I'm just at the grocery store. Uh-huh. And it's like, well, you know, you you should be doing social uh-huh. media and you should be uh-huh. using, you know, like DoorDash to yeah. deliver your groceries or whatever. I mean, actually, you're you're opening my mind a little bit here because I'm thinking like social media, there is something that only you can do. The only, only I only want to well. see you yes, right. on the thing. I don't want to see something delegated, you yes. know? The other thing, like in... Uh, in my book, The Lion's Gate, about the 67 Israeli war, that was one of the things Moshe Dayan, the great Israeli general, said, I don't want to do anything that somebody else can do. I want to do only those things that I can do and, and that no one can replace me. And he's absolutely right. Yeah, Plutarch's line was, a leader has to be able to do, ev- to do anything but can't do everything. Ah. So it's like, if, if you don't know how all this stuff works, like part of the reason I also feel like I can effectively delegate, let's say tasks on social media or part of, is like, I know how to do it and I know what I want it to look like so I can explain how that is. But I don't think I could explain how someone could write for me. Like only really I can do uh-huh. that. Um, all right. So going back to uh, put your ass where your heart wants to be. <laughs> there, you recommended this John Steinbeck uh, book to me, Journal of a Novel. Journal of a Novel, yeah. And there, he had a line in there where he's talking about 
dawdly days. I think it's a made up word yet, but it was the same thing. The days where you're not feeling it, where it's not coming. And you talk about this in the book where you're basically like, you don't expect perfection of yourself. You just have to show up and spend the time. That's it. So That's, talk to me about having, it's, it's like a high bar and that I have to do it every day, but it's a low bar. It seems like you're saying that you don't have to do it well every day. I mean, most of what we do is not so great, right? Yeah. It's certainly like the first time through. But what's really hard to me is sitting there and staying there, you know? Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I have found, in other words, I don't try to, and I'm sure you're the same way, I don't to torture myself with, is this good? You sure. know, as I'm writing a sentence, I'm writing a paragraph. The main thing is, is just to keep the ball moving. And at the end of the day, and I know at the end of the week, at the end of the month, you're gonna have something. You might have to redo it. The, the big danger, for me, is falling off the wagon, is losing the momentum. That's the most important thing to me in a book, is keeping going. I'm, I'm a big believer in multiple drafts of things. I don't sure. know how many drafts you write, but I will write 15, 16, 17 drafts. So when I'm on draft two or three, I'm not torturing myself about, is this great? I'll, I'll get the words right, you know, the, you know the, on the 17th crack. But, uh, my really, my only thing each day is, am I going to sit my ass down and put in the time? And I think that applies to anything, physical fitness, anything at all. Well, I think about that. It's like, if it exists, I can edit it to be good. If it does not exist, I cannot hey, edit right, it. Right, exactly. Like, there's no such thing as writing. There's only rewriting. Yes. You know? Well, and, and there, do you like that rule? It's like a couple crappy pages a day. Have you heard this? I do like that. Yeah. 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 Like, or there's another thing that somebody told me. It was like, uh, start a sentence with, and the bad version, maybe you even told me this, and the bad version is, and then you start writing it. And sure enough, the bad version becomes a good version after about 10 times. I, I've talked about this. One of the things that I do uh, is, so I have like a research assistant that helps me and obviously editors also. So like, as I'm writing a sentence, uh, I might go like, um, I don't, I don't even sometimes complete the sentence. Like I'll, I'll like, like, let's say I was talking about, uh, let, let you talk about Moshe Dayan. So I was, if, let's say I knew something about him and I'd be like, Moshe Dayan in the midst of the, and I'm like, wait, is the war in 65? <laughs> I, I didn't, I would just say in insert, blah, blah, blah. And I'll come, I'll, like, I fill in the details later. Yes. So I don't even want to lose the momentum of like, stopping to get the facts right because the facts can always be corrected but the 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 gist of the sentence or the the momentum of what you're trying to put down is more important than yes. than like getting it perfect yes you're exactly right in my opinion it's the magic of tk yes to come but the other thing in all sort of seriousness and i'm just thinking about this as we're talking about it when i'm working on a scene or something there's always a, a level of fear mm -hmm. that you're going into, right? And that makes you want to stay on the surface and not sort of really, yes. you know, imagine yourself into that moment or push whatever's going to happen in the moment. And so that's why I agree with you, Ryan, that if you noodle around too much with, is this the right word? You're, that's an excuse to give in to that fear. Much better to write some shitty sentence that does go into this, to, that shines that light on the dark spot, because you can always come back to it. Yes. And it, it is, it's crazy you know, to talk about fear in writing, but I think it's huge. It's a big, big part of it. And well, I think just very, overcoming that fear is everything. Very few people would, and maybe that's what's so insidious about it, very few people would characterize their perfectionism or wanting to get it right as being based in fear because they're like, no, I just care so much, but it's, that's actually what it is. It's prevent, the surface is more comfortable. So if you get bogged down, you're comfortable. True. It's, but, I would say it's a form of resistance. It's sure. the diabolical voice of resistance telling you, oh, get that sentence right, man, get it right. And what it's trying to do is to keep you from getting deep. That's right. Yeah, there's so a- we're turning, talking about writing here. This is interesting. Well, there's a Bible verse that I was, I heard recently, I'm butchering it, but it was something about how um, when you're plowing a field, 
if you look back to see the field that you've plowed, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. This is the, this oh, really? I like and, that. And I was trying to think about what that means. And then I think what it is, is that if you're, if you're plowing, so you, your horse is pulling the plow, you're standing behind it. If you stop to look back to see if it's straight, right, the, it will, you'll lose. Yeah, yeah, It yeah. will curve in yeah. the future. Yeah. So the, 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 the paradox there is by inspecting or feeling proud of or, you know, trying to fine tune what you just did. You, you not only is it already done, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but you are actually costing your, like now the horse is veering to the left or right because you've taken your attention off the task in front of you, which is the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's great. I agree. Um, Plutarch probably said that. No, this is in the Bible. Oh, um, oh it's in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but uh, the idea that you just show up, do the thing, don't sweat it too much. It, it's weird. It's it's almost like also, though, by, by saying, I'm just going to stay on the surface. I'm just going to do it. You're actually giving yourself the freedom to go into it deep because if you're it's like when you're conscious, when you're too conscious about what you're trying to do, you almost block yourself from doing it. Or I, yes, and I would say when I'm, it, I'm not trying to say stay on the surface, when, and not and not worry about. I'm saying go deep, yeah. but just don't worry about getting every comma right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, uh, Churchill said the other way to spell. Uh, Perfection is paralysis. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That was in your book about discipline. I yeah. think so, yeah. yes. So, Which is a great book, by the way. Thank you, thank you. So uh, here's an interesting thing. So I was thinking about this too, though. So I uh, wasn't feeling good, and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to force myself to do it. There is this part of me also that feels like sometimes I'm, I rush things. So instead of being like, you have time, take it day by day, you know, pace yourself, how do you think about the difference between like, I got to do it every day, no exceptions, and also pacing yourself, load management, you're in this for the long haul? I'm definitely a load management kind of a guy. I mean, yeah. because any kind of a book is like a year, two years, three years or something like that. And you'll drive yourself insane if you put too much of a deadline. And for me, I've always been a spec writer. You know, I haven't really done things on deadlines for publishers or anything sure. like that. So... I just say, you know, it's going to take two years. It's going to take three years. Take your time and do it, you know? Right. And three years is a lot of days and not it's all a lot those of days, days have to be. There's a lot of power in, in those days, you know? Yeah. I, I, I just, some, like, I, I was thinking about this. I was, uh, both my kids uh, refuse to nap in their beds. They only nap in the car. Really? And so, <laughs> so you're like, okay, I got an hour. Like, I need to drive them around for an hour, uh -huh. right, while they sleep. And then I found myself driving <laughs> fast. Ah. And I was like, but I don't have anywhere to go, ah. right? Like, like, why am I, like, I was driving, my son was asleep. So put aside the safety issue of it, which is also real. Ah. But I'm driving and I'm getting frustrated that the person in front of me is driving ah. below the speed limit. Ah. And I had to catch myself and go, but I don't have anywhere to be. Literally the whole purpose of what I'm doing is to kill one hour of uh -huh. time. And here I am trying to get that one hour done uh -huh. fastest. And so I kind of think about that with writing too, where it's like, why am I, like I gave myself a year on this. Why am I wondering if I'm behind schedule? Or even the one year is just a made up estimate. Like yeah. it takes what it takes, right? Yeah. And when you get to the end, then you're at the end. But there is, if you're, I think, driven or ambitious or a pro, there's this part of you that wants to just also just do it. And that there's a tension there because rushing almost never produces good work. No, it doesn't. And let me, I'm going to ask yeah. you a whole other question. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? What are you, I mean, you've been on a kind of a roll here following a certain course. Where, where's, no. have you thought about that? No, I mean, uh, I'd like to just, weirdly, I'd like to be doing the exact same thing 10 uh, years from now. Uh -huh. uh, like if you'd asked me 10 years, my first book came out exactly 10 years ago this month. Uh -huh. And so if you said 10 years in the future, You'll, I'll still with my wife, I'm still writing books. I'd be like, that's the dream. Uh -huh. You know, like I, I, there's not like a, uh, this isn't like a means to an end. So to go to the point about So like, there's no need to rush then. Right, it? exactly. Yeah. Like I want to, well, and it may actually be the opposite. There's a significant reason to pace yourself and yeah. think about, yeah. hey, if you burn yourself out, you won't be able to do this in yeah. 10 years. So I kind of think about yeah. it like that. You know, Diana and I took a driving trip 
I don't know when was it, like a year ago or less than a year ago, to some of the places that I used to work yeah. in North Carolina and Kentucky and places like that for a book because yeah. I wanted to see, uh, you know, what, remember where things were. And, of course, sure. everything was gone. You know, every building was gone. Everything was gone. And it made me think, this is on the subject of going slow yeah. rather than racing, how I wish I had paid attention more to what I was doing and what – what was happening at the time. And this is even a sidebar. This was the era. I've never been a photograph taking person. And this was before iPhones and sure, stuff like sure, that. Sure. So I have these periods of my life that were like really important to me. And I don't have a photo of anything. I don't have a picture of any of the people that I knew. I don't have a picture. And it's, and I also, you know, I have them here, but not as much as I wish I had them, you know? And I don't know whether it's apropos of anything. No, there it's is. just taken it it uh you know, I look around here, you can't really see, you guys can't see what's out here. It's a wonderful little alley with a bunch of little stores that are kind of funky old buildings and cabins. And you know, I'm trying to sort of take this in, you know, yeah. and what we're doing here too, you know? Well, there's this stoic practice that Mark Surrealis gets from Epictetus. He says, as you tuck your child in at night, you should say to yourself, like, they will not make it to the morning. Uh, and so there's a, a, a haunted n tragicness to that in that Marcus Rios loses like six children before they become adulthood. You uh, imagine just how terrible yeah, that would yeah, be. Yeah. But I don't think that's actually what the exercise was about. I think what he was saying is what, if, if that is true, you would not rush through the evening. Yeah. Right. Like, so why are you trying to get this over with? And I think about yeah. that with books too. Like, I like doing this. This is meaningful to me. I like being in this world. This is the dream. Uh, what's going to happen when I finish this one? I'm just going to start another one. So why am I rushing through this or anything? Because I guess the Stokes would say when you're rushing, where are you rushing towards? Yeah, Death, right. right? Yes. Like, <laughs> like you're not ru you're rushing away from now towards a thing that, yes, towards the next thing. But what's after the next thing? Yeah. What's after the there's yeah. only one thing after the next, yeah, next, yeah, next yeah. thing. So you might as well slow down and be here for the thing while you're in it, whatever that thing is, even if that thing can, is washing the dishes or stuck that? at the airport. I mean, I have to do that reminder uh -huh. or I won't do that. Yeah. Right. Do you journal in the evenings? I know you're a big journaler in the morning. Like when you put your kids to bed, do you take a moment and I, I review the day? Do it, I usually, re so I, when I do my journaling, I'm usually reviewing the last day in the morning. So I'm uh, thinking uh, about, I, see. Uh -huh. I, I, I sometimes I'll do both, but oftentimes I just don't have the time to do two different sets of the uh -huh. thing. Um, but yeah, I think uh, taking, taking a minute, like I have one journal where I just write one thing a day that I'm grateful for. So that's kind of a moment. Uh, but yeah, I'm usually reflect, a good chunk of the journaling I'm doing is about reflecting on, the day pass. I, I have this other journal I do that's one line a day. Uh, and I just write one line about, I usually am doing the day before. Uh -huh. So what I love about that is, and it's, it's, I have it in the bookstore, I'll show it to you, but it's, it's five lines on each page. Ah. And yeah, I was going to ask you, how do you keep this? Do you have like notebooks yeah. and? Well, it, so it's, it's called the one line a day journal. Uh -huh. And each page has five slots on it. So you keep this journal for five years. Ah. And so what I love about like, uh, this is in early June, I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh, this is when I started stillness on this day. Uh -huh. Two days later, one year later, I started lives. Of the, like uh -huh. I, I realized I was sort of almost unconsciously on a schedule of starting a book on uh -huh. this day, uh -huh. five years in a row. Wow. And what I really like about it is obviously like those cool anniversaries are, are helpful, but like um, it'll be like, Oh, like on this day, two years ago, I was in the middle of this chapter of this book and I was having a hard time. Uh -huh. And now I don't even think about that. And I'm very proud of that chapter. Just realizing that like yeah. you were, whatever this point was, you were at the, you've been at this point before. Yeah. It just sort of is what it is. Yeah. And you just, it just, at the end of the, with enough time, it just becomes a little entry yeah. in the journal. You that was a I mean? great part in your book. You know, uh, Discipline is Destiny, your new book that's coming out. At the very end, Ryan kind of takes apart 
uh, takes a chapter or an epilogue to kind of describe his own feelings as he's writing the book. And, and it was really hard. And you were in a state of despair, as you yes. say. And I know, like, same thing for me. Like, I don't journal what I should. But you do but, the, like, the blog. I feel like you're publicly journaling about what you're struggling with. But I don't really, like, when I look back to, you know, book four, book five, book six, I know there were periods that were really, really, really hard. And when I'm struggling in something now, I wish I could sort of flash back to that and sort yes. of that earlier person could say, relax a little. It's always like this, you know? This isn't the first time you've, you're doing this thing. Well, the, I, the, as I was writing in that afterward, I was thinking, I was like, I think I'm gonna have to ask for an extension. And like that, that seemed like such a huge thing. And in retrospect, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. why do I, like, yeah. If you need an extension, but everybody you need seems an extension. to go through that. Yeah. Like it, it is what it is. Yeah. You know? And so there, I think part of the irony of discipline or the daily practice that you're talking about is that it can also become a compulsion. Right. And it's not always the healthiest. Yeah. You're, like someone's yeah. like, hey, you know, like, uh, can you come? Like, I really need your help on this thing. And you're like, no, I have to do my daily practice. Uh -huh. And like, Six months later, you're like, I, I should just help that person. What did I need? Like, yeah, I could have skipped the thing for uh -huh. one. You know, like it, the you have to be careful. I think too that the ritual doesn't become like yeah. OCD or something. Although I'm the other school, I look back and I say, why did I help that person? You know, <laughs> did they really get anything out of it? Did they really That's do true. anything? You know, and meanwhile, I'm screwing myself up. Um, yeah. Although uh, I read this book about Tom Brady. Uh, called uh, better to be Lo better to be feared, and they were saying that like I I couldn't understand why he left the New England Patriots uh -huh. to go to Tampa Bay, and like because I mean you're on the best team in the history of sports with the best coach in the history of sports, and one of the arguments that the author I think it's Seth Wickersham from ESPN and he was saying that um, basically Tom Brady's wife was like uh, this is Giselle she was like. You can keep playing football as long as you want, but it should not be so painful. Like it shouldn't mm. be so torturous every day uh -huh. to do this thing. And part of, he was like, I want to go to a city where the weather isn't terrible. Uh -huh. I want to be a slightly less ruthless environment. I want it to be more, you know? Uh -huh. And so part of his decision to go there, it wasn't, it, it, it was, to play it in a slightly more balanced, mm. sustainable environment, uh -huh. which is that's different than Kevin Durant leaving the Warriors to go to Brooklyn, the right? Nets. Th yeah. yeah, this this is this is I think this is making a big change for better reasons. Mm -hmm. And you're analogizing that I, well, to I just related your to it, own the, I, work. It doesn't have to be awful. Uh -huh. Like the pra like the discipline and the practice of it should not make you miserable. Uh -huh. And if Sometimes it does, I like the awfulness of it. No, yeah. no, I think I think it should be part of it. But I guess the point is, it's if you've been awful. doing it for twenty five years and you hate every day of it, uh -huh. is that really winning? You know, like, or are is it winning if to be good at the thing you give up? happiness. I mean, did Tom Brady really hate it? I mean, I think for, this must be the same yeah. for you. For me, it's, it's a discipline. It's a, I have to overcome my own resistance. So that's hard. Yeah. Just like if you were running or training at the gym or whatever it is, but it's a joy to yes. do once, once you're in the cold pool and you're doing it. But it could, I guess his point was it could be a joy and pleasant at uh -huh. the same time. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't, if it's cold weather versus warm I'm weather. I'm sure it's, I mean, Football is a grueling sport, so I'm sure playing for Tampa is not like, uh, you know, it's not fake, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there's still a grind to it. His, I think his point was like, it, it, if you're, and I've talked to other athletes about this too, like they all look back on their career, they go like, I do wish I had more fun while I was doing it. Because mm -hmm. they, were, they were taking it so yeah. seriously yeah, yeah, that they yeah. were sucking the joy out of the day-to-day yeah. of it, which is... To me, the, the same thing. Like, if you're doing that, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah. It's like what I was saying about not, not paying attention in, in, in earlier years. Because I was so concerned with, you know, yeah. doing a job or getting something done or whatever. But if you're not doing that... At this point in your career, how often do you think about or even know, like, your sales numbers? I, I haven't even figured out how to, really? how to do it yet. Like, so, so 
it's, it's, that's probably a good place to be, right? Like you're, I you, think just, so. you write what you want to write, you do what you want to do. And you don't think about, you don't think about how it's doing. Yeah, I, I don't. It's like Butch Cassidy said, as long as we're, a, what did he say? As long as we break even or whatever, you know? Yes. I really just want to, my goal is just to be able to keep doing it, you know? That like the movie we were talking about, Save the Tiger, yeah. where they asked him, what does he want? And he said, line. another season. Yeah. That's what I want is another season. Yeah, I remember I was talking to Casey Neistat, the YouTuber once, and he, was saying, he said something like, he was like, the, the point of making money is to use it to make more work. Ah, uh huh. Yeah. Right? Like, he's like, because if you're really just after money, you would work in an ad agency or something. He was saying the point of making the money is to be able to fund the projects yes. that you want to be able yeah. to make. Yeah. yeah. So, that they obviously you have to have some level of success or you can't do it anymore. But it, there is, I, I, I do think as I've gone on, as I've done more books, like, I also like people ask me how many books I've written and I have to think about it, uh -huh. um, which I also really like. Uh -huh. Like I, I had this thing where like, if you don't forget what day it is, you don't like your job. Anymore. Uh -huh. You know, like if you lose it's track of what day it is, yeah, uh -huh. that's a good sign that you're doing something uh -huh. closer to what you should be doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, same with the pandemic, where like time you lost. The only way something. I know is is going to the gym and be looking to Sunday when I don't have to go. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but but yeah, as I've as I've done more, like I care less about uh -huh. how it does. Uh -huh. One, I think because I have a longer time span. Like I've seen books that didn't do good at first do good later. I also understand that I'm measuring over a longer period of time, so it really doesn't matter how it does in year one. What matters is, do you have seven years of pretty good years? Uh -huh. That adds up to a, a yeah. large number. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, I think you get to a point, too, where, like, you've, if you've proven that you can do it, it doesn't mean that much to you to do it again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you ever worry that you're losing a step? Or that, uh, yeah, are you, think, or do you consider, that. I'm just getting better and better and better? I mean, I guess you... I. I guess you assume you're always getting better at it, but you don't know. And it is helpful if people are like, no, this is like really good. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's nice. But yeah, it's yeah, getting I, to the next level. Get there. Yeah. I, I do envy people in sports because they have such a clearer sense yeah. of winning or losing or whether they're getting faster or. Yeah, they have numbers, know, right? They yes. can be measured. Yeah. Yes. And I feel like right when writers try to apply numbers, they're almost always getting it, yeah. the numbers in writing of people are like i do a thousand words a day it's like this yeah. is made up yeah um I, I feel like the numbers in almost every other yeah. profession are counterproductive yeah it's like actors say you know with the actors should not be competing against other, each other yeah in for the academy awards because how can you compare one performance to another both great if I like, they're at that level i like how comedians just think about it in terms of stage time mm. like or how, or how many nights are you getting, how many nights a week are you getting up or how many times a night are you getting up? They're just thinking about it in terms of doing it. And I guess you're just, the assumption is that the more you do it, the better you get at it, mm. which I'm, I think is true. I guess sometimes I'm wondering if I'm not holding something back, but your point about service, uh, surface level is true. It's like, how do you know, like, I think as I've gotten better at what I do, I've discovered ways where you can kind of cheat, right? Like where you can, it's a, a form or a, uh -huh. a and like, am I, do you, I guess, do you ever think about that? Like, am I, am I really pushing myself? Am I really breaking new ground? Or am I just doing the same thing over and over again? Mm, yeah, I do think about that. And sometimes I blame myself and I do do that, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but I think most of the, like, even if you are doing that, sometimes that's a way to get to the headspace or the moment where that's, that's you, suddenly you break yeah. through and you do do something yeah. better. Another thing I've been thinking about lately is the difference between hour one and hour three when you're mm. working on something that, because lately I haven't been able to do like a four hour day or something like that. And when you get into that fourth hour, when you really are getting deep into something, you know, you're, you've been into it so, so far in your head, that stuff appears in the fourth hour that doesn't appear in hour one. And uh, 
I haven't been in that fourth hour in a while. I tend to do it like, so I'll do like two or three hours. That, like that's like a good day for me in the morning. Uh -huh. I'll do that. And then it'll be like, I'll be on a bike ride or a run in the afternoon, like mm -hmm. several hours later. And then something will click and yeah. that uh, I'll write it down on a note card or whatever. And that will be the thing that goes in there. And I just think about how much of my books are those sentences mm. or the or like, ah, this is the perfect way to tie these two things together. Mm -hmm. And that really, so if I don't do the surface level three hours in the morning, I'm not setting myself up for the eureka moment yeah, yeah. in the bath later. And really it's the eureka moment in the bath that's everything, but you can't have one without the other. True. Yeah, it's the work that sets up that, that moment, yeah. There's a story that I was reading, I think I'm gonna to try to use it in the book I'm doing now because I'm doing this uh, book on justice. Um, uh, there's a rabbi, he wrote that book, um, when good things happen to bad people. I, I, forget I know name. the book, but I... Uh, and he was saying that as he sits, because I, I was thinking about you putting your ass where your heart wants to be, but also um, the, the prayer you say to the muses each morning. So he, he doesn't do that, but every morning when he sits down to write, and I guess he's not a full-time writer, so maybe he doesn't do it every day, so it makes more financial sense. But the point is, every day when he sits down to write, before he writes a word, he gets out his checkbook and he writes a small check to a charity. Like really? he picks That's a different charity each time. Ah. And the point is he's making a donation or an offering, he's ah. saying, to the muses or to God ah. or to the person that he wants ah. to be. And that this is setting the tone for the ah. writing day. That's really interesting. And ah. I think I want to start doing that. But uh -huh. it reminded me of how you think about it. Ah, yeah. I don't write a check, but, uh, <laughs> but I definitely believe that you need a moment of putting your ego aside, like uh, Mr. Rogers or whoever's word to hang his little cardigan on the hook, yeah. you know, when he goes in there and- He sings and the song, that, he changes his shoes. Yeah, you know, that I'm at the service of something else. My ego is not a part of this thing. And, you know, help me, you know? The, I, I talked about this in um, Stillness, I think. At Mr. Rogers, the, to me, the operative part of the opening of that thing is the first thing that you see is the flat, it shows the house, it zooms in, and then it's the flashing yellow light of the trolley car, ah. which uh, a, a person who knew him was saying that, uh, he was saying like, slow down, ah. like caution, yeah, slow yeah. down. Uh -huh. And so I think that to me, that's what that offering is, or that headspace is, the ritual of it is like, ah. I'm entering a special place, I'm slowing down, I'm leaving behind what I would normally, you know, I'm changing into my work clothes or whatever the thing is, then I'm going in, mm -hmm. going into the mind. Mm -hmm. But I do think, uh, I do think the, the, if you think about like before battle, the Spartans or whomever, they're sacrificing the goat or the uh -huh. chicken or whatever. It's the offering to the gods, right? It's like, a, it's a sign of uh, obedience or, or submission. It's a, it's a gift because you're wanting something yeah. in return. That's what the prayer is about. And it's also, this is, this, is real, this is really interesting. I love to think about this and I can't even, they're also, when they're sacrificing, they're really saying, is this an auspicious time for sure. us to go out there and risk our lives? Yes. And so they're definitely a believer that there's another dimension out there. Like, I'll tell you a long story. We've got time here. Yeah. I was uh, in Africa and we went to visit the Maasai out in this place where you had to like fly in a helicopter to get there because there was no roads. This story takes a few minutes, so Go bear with me. And when we got there, there was a, it was a, the middle of the day, and there was a camp, and there were the cattle and all the women and everything like this. And we had just, the shaman had just done something, and he said, we got to move the camp. And sure enough, like in order to move the camp, they first had to collect all the cattle, and they had to get the white cattle first. And like, they weren't all in one place. It was like this family had one, this, so it was a production. And everybody had to break down their tents, and, and they all did it in a very good spirit. You know, nobody was bitching, you know, yeah. oh, I got it. And when they finally moved, they only moved like 300 feet up the, and I thought, to, you know, at the time, you accept it completely. But then I thought to myself, what did the shaman see? What was happening, I wished I could have talked to the guy then, what was bad there that was okay 300 feet away? So when the Spartans are taking the omens, it's the same sort of thing. And I, I think in a lot of ways the artist's life 
is about that dimension, that world that we don't see, you know, that the shaman saw. And, and the tricks of like uh, taking the omens and the entrails of a, you know, a yes. pigeon or whatever, why does that tell you what, you know, but I swear to God, there's something there, you know, even though we laugh at it now, oh, it's isn't it quaint that they, you know, but there's something there like the Spartan army. In fact, I know you know this, how, what a march out must take in terms of getting everything together, the equipment, the armor, the mental saying goodbye to the family. They'd go to the border of Lakedamon, take the omens, and if they were bad, they'd turn around and went back. So, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, Elizabeth Gilbert calls it like the big magic or whatever. Uh -huh. If you accept it, once you sort of humble yourself by going, this isn't me, there's something happening here then the other stuff doesn't feel so silly anymore yeah. because you're like, it already is something weird about it. Yeah. Why is like writing that check is, yeah. is not a dumb thing. You know, it's a, it's magic. Yeah. So I think it's in the artist journey. You have like, you take like Bruce Springsteen and you're like, here's all Bruce Springsteen's albums. Uh -huh. He was like, clearly you're like, he's going through something. You like list the catalog of the artist's work. So if you were to list the, the catalog of your work, what do you think it is that you're working at? Like what, when you, if you can do that in your head, when you look at all the books and, and it's, it's kind of a magical thing to be able to look at the body of work that way. What do you, what strikes you about what you've done? Have uh, you done that? That's a great question. I have done it and, but not as deeply as I should. But there definitely is a theme there. And the theme, I think, is that it's a Marcus Aurelius theme. Life is a battle and a, and a journey far from home, you know? Yeah. And that whether it's the internal battle or, or an external battle, uh, I think that's sort of what I'm exploring. And uh, if I can say something, I was thinking after I read your book last night, Discipline is Destiny, there was something that I wanted to say. It's another long thing. Okay. Can I go over your long thing here? We got time. It's like, um, what's the purpose of discipline? Like, you and I are very disciplined guys. If anybody watched us get up in the morning, they would say, wow, wish I could do that. But they also might say they're crazy to be, you know, lashing yeah. themselves like they are. But, okay, here's my long version of it. I believe that life operates on two levels. I know you know this is my, you know, and the, and the up and the higher level is the the muse level, the level we were just talking about that the shaman saw. Sure. The level of your calling of your work, whatever that is, and the lower level is our material plane. Yeah. And on that lower level is the force that I call resistance with a capital R, that's there to stop us from reaching sure. this higher level, right? And if we don't reach this level, or we don't do our work, we don't follow our calling, then we get sick and we do bad things and shit happens, right? So what is the purpose of discipline? Discipline is what takes you to that higher level. That's right. That's why you have to have it. You can't wish your way there. You can't chant your way there. You can't, uh, whatever was that book, The Secret. You can't vibe <laughs> your, way, your there. way there. Yeah, you can't. The law of attraction is not going to get It's bullshit. Yeah. The only way you get there is through hard work. Right. Because the, the, the beings that inhabit this higher level that we want to associate with, that's the only thing they respect. You know, you've got to punch your ticket and pay the price. So discipline is not a bad thing. You're not crazy to work to be self-disciplined because that's what gets you to this higher level and also gets you to just just live your life so that when the day is over, you're, you're calm. Yes. You're not freaking out as some of us have in the past. That's beautiful. I love it. Well, Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, so that's why. Everybody buy. <laughs> Discipline is destiny. And likewise, the new uh, book, Put Your Ass Where Your Heart Wants to Be, is incredible. As always, this is my copy of The War of Art, Turning Pro, The Artist's Journey, Gate to Fire. I've loved all your stuff, and thank you so much. All right. Thank you for everything you've done for me. You don't even know the things that you've done for me. Likewise. And thank you for, while we're talking, for giving me off of your book, The Daily Stoic, the idea of doing a, me doing a book. Oh, yeah. When is that coming it's, out? It was all involved in all of the – it's coming ah. it, next year at the earliest. Amazing. But uh, thank you for that, even though we I, haven't – it's I, done. I, that was very much a selfish suggestion so I could read it. Ah. Okay. Well, I hope you like it when it finally comes sure. out.